our church family, and how everyone pulls together. Would you pray with me now as we get into the message? Heaven, uh, Heavenly Father, we just turn to you again, acknowledging that this entire experience is about you anyways. We enjoy the fellowship, we enjoy the friendship and, and the interactions that we have here, and they are precious. But Father, our ultimate goal is to draw close to you and to enjoy this time that we have together uh, with you, Father, and with our friends and uh, our family. So Lord, just bless the word now as it is spoken. May it be your word that is heard. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, so I had a moment during worship. Jess, when you said above all is an oldie. <laughs> I had a moment. <laughs> Above all is an oldie. Wow. I didn't think I was that old. <laughs> it's like when you're on the radio station, you know, and you flip, hey, this is my jam. You know, you're listening to it, and then the, it breaks in. You've been listening to the oldie station, and you're like, what? God is good, isn't he? Ah. Uh, well, uh, today I, I'm going to begin kind of another uh, a series of sorts uh, with messages piggybacking on one onto the another, kind of on the, the, the title as it goes here of The Story, The Story. And, and I hope that you'll appreciate and understand uh, where I'm going with the message as we get into it. But I always begin my messages with a, uh, a kid's quiz. And Toby, could I have your help? And if I could have one more person also help out. I'd like to have, thank you, Mitch. Appreciate that. We have a, we have several young people in the congregation and I, I just appreciate our kids that come to church. And I just like to have this little opportunity to have an interactive time of the sermon called a kid's quiz and just ask some basic questions that kind of lead us into the topic of the sermon. So they're simple, straightforward. Raise your hand. We'd like, want to get it on the mic so that people watching at home can hear it so it's recorded and you'll be able to hear it better in the, the sanctuary. So go ahead and raise your hand and Mitch and Toby will run up to you with a mic. Can you quote the first verse of the Bible? Do you know this verse? Genesis 1.1. Who knows the first verse of the Bible? He is able. Uh oh, red. Oh, is the red one not working? Oh, go ahead, give it a try, Abel. Yeah, it's it's working. Hello. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I think he got it, didn't he? Absolutely. That's one we all want to know. That's an important verse. So thank you. Number two, similar. Where does this verse? Now I'm doing the opposite. I'm giving you the verse. See if you can tell me where it's from. Another in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do any of our young people know where you could find that in the Bible? Didn't mean to make it super tricky. Anyone? All right, you can get some help from mom and dad if you want to. Abel. First John 1.1. 1, 1. It's <laughs> it, you threw the first in there. It's not first John, uh, but John one one. So thank you helping out. We've got uh, the whole family getting involved. <laughs> All right, number three. Finish this verse if you can. Revelation twelve seven through nine. And there was war someplace, and the devil was thrown down to a different place. What places are we talking? Where was this war taking place? Abel, I know you've got it, but we're going to keep uh, including more in the service. Okay, I see London's hand. We're going to give Geo a chance, and then we'll come back to London. There was war. Where? Where the war happens was heaven. Heaven? The death and the hate. Um, what is the name? The Lord um, threw the devil back down on earth. I think he got it. Didn't, didn't he get it? Is that what you were going to say, London? I knew it was. And that's what the Bible verse says. There was war. Crazy to think about. I mean, we think of heaven as being that place where these things don't exist, but that's where it was. There was war in heaven. The devil is thrown down to the earth. And so we'll look at that a little bit as well. All right, number four. This is the last one, Toby. It's just so you know. Where were these words spoken and who said them? 
It's from John 19.30, and it says, It is finished. Who spoke them and what was happening at that time? Oh, Emmett. Got you there, sir. It was spoken by Jesus and it was said on the cross. Yeah, that's right. He knows that story. Jesus spoke them on the cross. Thank you so much. Appreciate our sound engineer, technician, extraordinary leaders here. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, Mitch. Now, each of these verses has a meaning and role in the message this morning, and I hope that that will come across as we get on. You know, everyone loves a good story. There's just something very natural and human about learning and, and journeying with someone in their story or appreciating a story. And all good stories, all true stories, and I don't mean true like fictional, non-fictional, but to make it an actual story other than uh, another part of the literature, has very common elements. And believe me, this is a layman's a description. I don't have a, a master's degree in literature or rhetoric or anything like that, but almost all stories have these basic elements. They have an introduction, some kind of context to let you know what's going on and how the story begins. Every story has a hero. Not every story has a villain, but every story has a hero or heroine, all right, or a focus of some kind. Every story has a problem or a conflict. Every story there's something that has to get solved or answered or addressed or clarified. If it doesn't have it, you're not talking about anything, right? Every story, there's a problem or a conflict. Every story, you have an apex, climax, turning point of some kind, okay? And mo virtually every story, again, a layman's approach here, I, you know, just from my perspective, has some sort of epilogue or conclusion or moral. Right? And by the way, we could probably break out into 10 more categories. We could add more. But I think these basics uh, give the parameters of what every story has. And the Bible verses that I've applied to this kind of show you where these elements are found within the biblical story. And this is something that uh, I actually find to be quite powerful and significant within the gift of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to the Christian world as we've come out of the Reformation. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has restored the story of the Bible that was lost during the Dark Ages. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has contributed a context and a larger uh, uh, worldview of the story back to Christianity that was lost. We call it the Great Controversy. But I have found that even amongst Adventist circles, the meaning and the power and the purpose of the great controversy has kind of gotten muddled or forgotten or lost. To a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, when they hear great controversy, they think of the writings of Ellen White. They think of her book, The Great Controversy, and they think of, if they know that book, they think, oh, that's about the struggle of Christians during the birth of Christianity and through Europe. That's what the great controversy is. Well, yes, but that's not the entire arc of the great controversy. Other Seventh-day Adventists hear great controversy, and they just equate it with the gospel. Oh, the great controversy, that's the gospel. That's what Jesus did to save us. There was this controversy, and Jesus came in, and he died on the cross and he saved us and so they kind of make the gospel equivalent to the great controversy but and while the gospel is the turning point it is the the, the central feature of the great controversy the gospel is not the great controversy it is different. The great controversy is the story that makes the cross and the gospel make sense. Without the great controversy, without the further understanding of the story, we lose the power and meaning of the different chapters within the story. Any of you ever come into a movie halfway? You've never seen it before, but you happen to walk in and you start to watch it and you're just lost. No one has ever done this before. I'm the only one. So I, I'm sorry to have to use my family. Did I just die or did it just get quiet? You can still hear me. Do I need to get louder? <laughs> I rarely have to get louder. I'm sorry to do this to you, Toby, but this just happened this week. Um, I was having a little trouble sleeping, and so I was flipping through uh, the TV, and I happened to come upon uh, the Rex Harrison Dr. Doolittle movie from the 1960s, the original Dr. Doolittle movie. Okay, I don't know. It's a musical. I love Rex Harrison. I love musicals, so I pop on. I'm watching Dr. Doolittle, and Toby walks in halfway. 
And he's like, what are you doing? What are you watching? I said, well, I'm watching Dr. Doolittle. Now, he's seen some of the Dr. Doolittles, the more modern ones with Eddie Murphy and then the one with Robert Downey Jr. But the original one's quite different. It's a musical. The story's different. And he happened to come in right when the Push Me Pull You was there. Hey, Ron, you guys have seen the... Have you seen 1967 Rex Harris and Norma Varden? Okay, the Millars. We're together. All right. Yes, the Push Me Pull You. Okay, he is asking all these questions. I don't get it. What's going on? I don't want to. And I tried to say, well, you kind of got to see the beginning and all this. And why are you even here anyways? Get out of here. Um, when you come into the middle of a story and you don't know the greater context, you can start to invent things. Well, maybe it's this. Maybe it means that. But if, you're, if you don't have the full story, you're going to miss what the meaning of the story is. And much of Christianity, again, the Reformation did great things at restoring a lot of biblical truth, bringing the Bible back into focus, making grace first and foremost, restoring parts of the elements of the cross, and, and getting us back to, to a, a good uh, a biblical base in some ways. But the great controversy provides the greatest uh, uh, overarch of which the story must be understood or else things get muddled. And so uh, that's what I want to uh, bring back to your attention today is how the story of the great controversy helps us understand the different chapters of the Bible. And when I say chapters, I just mean the major elements and parts of the Bible that make sense. And this is going to be an ongoing discussion as I develop different parts of the story uh, with you. But now I'm just going to provide the outline here. So we're going to go right to the introduction first. We come to the Bible and we read Genesis 1-1. That's the natural thing to do. It is not by chance that the Bible was arranged in the books and orders in which they were. This was the sovereignty of God that led it this way. And we might argue with it and say, well, why didn't we start with Job? Or why didn't we start with another place? But God wanted it to be this way, and, though, and so that, that's the way it is. Genesis 1-1 begins with the verse we've all known since we were into uh, church as a little child or whenever we learned it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there's been lots of discussion on the creation evolution side of that. We're not going to get into that right now. From the perspective of faith, this is the opening salvo of God giving us the first introduction to the story. And the story begins with God making the declaration, I am the creator. I created heaven and earth. In, in Hebrew, it, the first um, statement of the Bible is seven words. Okay? Bereshit bara Elohim et ha shamayim vayet ha eretz. Don't be impressed. It's the only passage in the Bible that I can quote in Hebrew. I can't quote another one, but I know this one. The Hebrew rabbis referred to it as the first seven. They saw that the first seven words of the Bible began what they saw as a the beginning of a seven of a sacred cycle of seven that would continue throughout the Torah. God begins the story with seven sacred words. And of course, the Sabbath is then emphasized in chapter 2. The Lord completed his work on the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day. And God blessed the seventh day. So you see the sacred cycle of seven uh, established there. And then throughout the Torah, the forgiveness of debts was based on a cycle of seven. The releasing of slaves was based on a cycle of seven. The Jubil year of Jubilee was based on a cycle of seven. The uh, sabbatical land law was based on a cycle of seven. But it all begins with the first seven words of the Bible. And this is very important because God, at the very beginning of the story, right at the introduction, declares, I have established the heavens and the earth by my word and by my authority, not based on astronomical or natural sequences. Every other time frame that we measure is based upon natural astronomical things the the seasons you know we have a 24-hour day because that's how long it takes the earth to rotate it's astronomical it's natural we have a 365 day year because of that's how long it takes the earth to go around the sun we have a roughly 30 day month because that's how long it takes the moon you know and then all the seasons and hours are all breakdowns of that all of that can be explained through natural astronomical observations, but not the sacred cycle of seven. That is based purely on the word of God. And God in verse chapter one of Genesis in verse one says, I am the creator. I am above nature. I am supernatural. And I am beginning the cycle of seven right now here in Genesis 1.1. And I do that based on my authority as, of God. We do not keep the Sabbath because it falls within an astronomical breakdown. It's because it's based solely on the word of God, right? We do it because God said so. It's based on his word, 
Not because the sun, moon, and stars happen to set a season that we can measure by that. Are you with me so far? I know, I haven't, I know I'm going fast, but I haven't preached in three weeks, folks. We're going to just go with it. This is the introduction. I am the creator God. I created everything. But then something happens in chapter 2, or in verse 2. And you're going to need to stay with me on this because uh, it doesn't always uh, appear this way. Notice that, just think of it for a second. If you were reading this for the first time, if you, were re if you didn't grow up with this as a child or you hadn't heard it a hundred times, if you were just, if someone said, look, I want to tell you about God. I want to tell you about the beginning. And God is the greatest God ever. He's the most wonderful God ever. He's the one. And let's read about how God did it. All right? If you were to pretend that you're just reading this for the first time, and Genesis 1-1 says, He made heaven and earth. And then verse 2 begins this way. The earth was formless. And the earth was void. And the earth was dark. Right? And the, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. It would at least invite the idea, why did God begin with darkness and chaos and lifelessness and void? Now, the, the, the basic Christian answer throughout the ages has been, this is just simply God giving the sequence. He's not going to leave it that way. It's just the sequence. He started this way, but then he's giving the sequence. And that's been the standard Christian reply. That's how we would naturally look at it. It, it. You know, God wanted to do this over seven days. So he doesn't just do everything immediately. He does it over seven days. But if we stop there, if we make that our conclusion, we have missed the overarching story. We're inserting our own answers. What we've actually discovered in Genesis 1 verse 2 is that we are not at the beginning of the story. We have walked into the middle. We have walked into the middle. The little analogy I'll give to you is like Genesis 1-1 is like the opening scroll or the opening crawl in Star Wars. It's kind of letting you know, here's how we got here. But then Genesis 1-2 is the first scene. The battle has already begun. There's a story that took place before Genesis 1-2. And we haven't read about it yet. We have to get further into the Bible to discover what happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Because it seems as though conflict and darkness is already here. And those things are devoid from the character of God. When we read the Bible, when we come to understand who God is, there's nothing about Him that is dark. There's nothing about Him that is lifeless. There's nothing about Him that's chaotic. How can Genesis 1-1 say in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the result of that creation is lifeless and dark and chaotic? And the standard thing to say, well, it's just sequence, is missing the larger story that God draws us into later in the Bible. And every pagan culture that Satan has been able to uh, uh, deceive has allowed that same interpretation. Every pagan culture teaches that, that creation came out of darkness and chaos and lifelessness and disorder. And that is not what the biblical story teaches. What we discover is we've walked into the middle of the story in Genesis 1, uh, 2, and 3. And the very first thing that God says, let there be light, is the first description of conflict that we read about in the Bible. Light is now conflicting with darkness. And praise the Lord, light wins, right? That's not the issue. The issue is not about whether who wins or not, but God is inserting himself into a darkness that he does not want to be there. It was not his plan for there to be darkness and chaos. He's a God of order. He's a God of light. And we find out we are now in the middle of the story. So we are not in the introduction. What we've actually entered into is act three of the story. Not act one. Genesis 1-1 is the introduction. But we're now in the middle of the story when we get to Genesis 1-2. Now I know there's debate about that. Not everyone agrees with this. But I think it's fairly easy to describe and illustrate. So let me continue on with this. So... We're going to look at the story developing in certain acts. And acts, act three of the story is conflict, is darkness. 
is, is God intervening in the chaos and in the lifelessness and the darkness that was not supposed to be here? Right? So let's go to Act 1. Where So it's intervention. What is Act 1 then? Where can we find, if that's not the beginning, where can we find the beginning? And I'm going to suggest to you that John answers that for us. When John writes his gospel, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he specifically and intentionally borrows the language of Moses from Genesis 1.1. He begins with the same words, in the beginning. He does that intentionally and purposely. Any Jew, anyone that was aware of that, when they heard that word, of course, coming in the Greek now and um, from the Hebrew Old Testament or the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. So in the Greek, in arcane, halagos, okay? In the beginning was the word. The Hebrew thinker would say, he is talking about Genesis 1-1. But then John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, now wait a minute. But I'm not going yet. We're not yet to the chaos. We're not to the darkness. I'm going to tell you what happened before that. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now this is not just a playful statement to introduce us to the person of Jesus Christ. Of course, we know the Word is Jesus. Later on, he says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've sometimes limited the meaning of the Word. Just, oh, that's just a reference to Jesus. That's just the second person of the Godhead. And John's just saying, hey, he was there in the beginning. That was great and wonderful, and he's one with God. Okay? Okay? That is true and accurate, but that's a narrow way of looking at what John is trying to say here. He uses the Greek word logos when he calls uh, Jesus the Word. Now, this is a very profound word within the Greek language. It means much more than word. It means meaning. It means that which matters. It means rationale. It means reasonability. Okay? In the beginning, there was balance. In the beginning, there was harmony. In the beginning, there was unity. In the beginning, there was meaning and purpose. In the beginning, there was rationality. In the beginning, there was no darkness. That's what John is saying. In the beginning, there was no chaos. In the beginning, everything was together. In the beginning, the Word made sense. In the beginning, there was no deception. In the beginning, there was no deceiver. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word made sense. Now, we don't know a lot about this time in biblical history. In the story that we're looking at, the first chapter, the first act, that we're reading about here in John 1.1, 1, 1, and the final act of the recreation, we have narrow little windows to look through. And I think partly that the reason for that is because of sin, Paul says, eye has not seen, nor uh, ear has not heard, eye has not seen, nor has entered in the heart of man that which God has prepared for us. If God was to show us everything that he has in store for us in heaven, or if God was to reveal to us everything what life was like before sin, we would look at it and go, huh? I don't get it. It's too bright. It's too wonderful. I don't get it. So we get these narrow little visions because we are limited by sin. But all we know is that before the darkness, before the chaos, before lifelessness, the heavens and the earth and the universe were at peace. And everything made sense. In the beginning was the Word, and everything was okay. And of course, John goes on to say more about it, and he, you'll see he'll make a direct contrast with Genesis. Genesis begins with darkness. Genesis begins with lifelessness, void, and, and, and the abyss of the deep. John says, no, in the beginning, in him was life, not void of life, not voidness. In him was life, and his life was the light of men. The beginning begins with life, friends. In the beginning, there was light and joy and power. But then something happened. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And again, this is kind of another one of those statements why we can't always see the full picture of heaven or what life was like or what God was like before sin because we're still bound in some to some degree in the brokenness of sin and darkness. And we still struggle to comprehend the light, don't we? But in the beginning, it was not that way. But as 
God saw a need for it. He let his light shine in the darkness. And here we again see the conflict. So these are this is the first act, perfection. There was a time of absolute perfection. But there's also came a time when God had to intervene in the darkness. What happened in between? What about act two? Act two is when the clicker doesn't work. Rebellion. <laughs> what happened? Why did, why did perfection fail? Well, the Bible tells us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But there was war in heaven. Now again, I want to just, some of you Bible scholars, put the brakes on just for a second. I realize there's great debate about when the timing of this war was. And there's people that make strong arguments, no, this is about the time of the cross and the time of the birth of the church. And I'll give that to you. That might be the more direct interpretation of the war in heaven. But it, there are definitely at least echoes to the original rebellion in heaven, or vice versa. It could be directly about the first war in heaven, but it, it's an analogy of the war that took place at the time of the cross and the birth of the church, or it's simply both. But here's what's clear. When God created on our planet, the deceiver was already here. He was already here. When God talks to Adam and Eve and says, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and, and evil, it's because he knew that there was a tempter there. Rebellion had already started. So regardless of how firm you want to place the, the scriptural context of this, the intent and the meaning clearly at least applies to the first rebellion of the devil in heaven. And 2 Peter and Jude will make similar statements that you cannot help but um, acknowledge. I didn't put them on the screen, um, but I want to read them. 2 Peter uh, 2 and verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them where? Into hell and to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. The word he uses for hell is Tartarus. It just means a place of darkness. What was the earth when God came to it in Genesis 1-2? It was darkness. It was the abyss. You with me? Someone? I know they're not really happy thoughts. There's not a lot of hallelujah moments in that, but this is important to understanding the story. And if we don't understand the story, we will sometimes misinterpret the major themes of the story. And many Christians today, whether it's the Ten Commandments or the Sabbath or the issue of abortion or transgenderism or any of these things, if you get the context of the story, you will be that much more better equipped to see the Bible response to these issues. And you won't be filling in the blanks with your, your, with your own ideas as much. And that's a lot of what Christianity does today. Well, we don't really understand how this applies to us today, so I'm just going to make it up. I don't like this. I like that. Don't do this. I don't do that. But they're not doing it based upon the context of the story, but based upon their own supposition. There was war in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down to the earth. That is the second part of the story. Rebellion. We have perfection that's followed by rebellion and then intervention. But note this, please. The intervention of God begins before God creates mankind. Okay? Sometimes we think that the plan of the gospel is only about my sins. That the only reason Jesus died on the cross is because I'm a sinner. But when we understand the story, we realize that God begins to intervene before mankind even sinned, before they were even created. God enters into the darkness and begins to conflict with it because there's a greater issue at, at, at stake than just my sin and your sin. Yes, obviously God cares deeply and, and wants those things to be resolved, but the story is greater than you and me. And we need to see that. If, if it's just about us, we're going to be too much of tunnel vision, not realize the larger story. So what's the, the fourth act? The fourth act is redemption. And it comes to that verse that we know so well and was part of the kids' quiz, uh, John 19, 30. When Jesus was on the cross... This is the crowning moment of the response of God. This is the ultimate result of his intervention and his redemption. Jesus on the cross 
when he uttered those words, it is finished. Now, a lot of ink has been spilt, a lot of sermons spoken. I've probably preached on it a few times, and we could go left and right in all kinds of ways on this. But what I really want us to focus in on is that when Jesus said it is finished, it meant a lot more than simply, I have now secured humanity's ability to be saved. I want you to notice, if you haven't read Desire of Ages lately, it's a great thing to consider. Notice what it says in Desire of Ages. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. Did you, did you see that? Angels. Don't forget, when the rebellion took place in heaven, how many of God's children fell victim to the deceptions of the dragon? fell victim? One-third, brother Mark. Right. We'll have to talk about that sometime. And I will cast the demons from your soul. <laughs> the Bible talks about a third of the stars of heaven were swept out of heaven by the deceptions and the working of the devil. Okay? Does God care about the safety and security of those remaining two-thirds and then the un other worlds and created beings that are part of his creation? Are they part of this great controversy? It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Notice this. It was for them as well as us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. It was for them as well as us. Go, notice she goes on to say this. At the beginning of the great controversy, at the beginning of the story, the angels did not understand this. Had Satan and his host been left to reap the full result of their sin, they would have perished. But it would not have been apparent to heavenly beings that this was the inevitable result of sin. In other words, God could have, Mr. Devil, have you really decided to rebel? Yes, sir, I'm going to rebel. I don't love you anymore. Okay, boom, you're gone, dead, out of there. No more existence. God could have done that, right? But God knew if he did that, it would not answer the question of sin. The other two-thirds of angels would have said, huh, so if we decide not to follow you, uh, there's no possibility that that would be successful and you're just going to wipe us out. And you claim to be a loving God. Maybe Satan had it right after all. You see what I'm saying? The issue at stake was much larger than one planet or one circumstance that we often isolate the gospel and great controversy to you all. Heavenly beings uh, would not know that this was the inevitable result of sin. A doubt of God's goodness would have remained in their minds as an evil seed to produce his deadly fruit of sin and woe. Okay, are, are you seeing the bigger picture of the story? The great controversy, sometimes we say, well, God, how come you just don't solve it for me now? I mean, man, I'm praying, and I just, if you could just do this for me right now. I mean, what's preventing you from doing this for me right now? We have to remember there's a larger issue at stake than our circumstance right now. God has to consider all the implications, not just for us and our circumstances, and not just for our world, but for the entire universe. God must have an answer that satisfies the question of his character. So we have perfection interrupted by rebellion. Then God intervening in that circumstance and bringing redemption to us. And here's the epilogue. Here's the final result. Uh, and we read about it in Revolution, uh, Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, going right back again to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but something happened. And now God has got to restore that. So, God, so John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, the first had passed away. And then notice what he says a few verses later. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega. I am the beginning. In the beginning was the word. I'm that beginning. And I am the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts, uh, to anyone, the, the one who thirsts, the spring of the water of life without cost. I am still the source of life. 
and my ability and my pleasure in giving life is still based upon freedom. Come and choose. Make me your God and I will make you live forever. That was me in the beginning and that is me in the end. Still a God of love. Still a God of freedom. Still a God of beauty and joy. And I will provide gladly the life that you desire. But sadly, there were those who chose to reject. And God says, this is my response. So in summary, the story is bigger than just our world, our sins, and our salvation. Now, those are critical. I mean, that is, that is clearly we want to have confidence and hope that our sins and that our situation is dear and near to the heart of God and that He is doing everything and has done everything necessary for our salvation. But the story is bigger than that. It goes beyond that. The fate of the universe hangs on God's ability to prove that His character his law is holy, just, and good. And you, you hear people say, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Why, why, why couldn't he just say, I forgive you? I mean, people say that all the time. Like when someone wrongs me, you know, maybe they, they, took, money, they took money out of your, their, my wallet, and then they apologize. And they, well, you know, I forgive you. I, well, do, do you want the money back? No, 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 I just forgive you. Why can't God do that? I mean, haven't you ever thought about that before? Why couldn't God just up on his throne, sit down and look down at Dave Lounsbury, and Dave Lounsbury says, I'm sorry, God, would you forgive me? Okay, we're good. Come on into heaven. Why can't God do that? Because there's a larger issue at stake. Okay, I know I'm going a little bit long. A 30-second little analogy, and Mitch says it's okay. Um, when I was living up in the Northwest, there was a very, maybe I've said this story before, forgive me. There was a very, uh, very popular story uh, in the state of Oregon where there had been a terrible, terrible crime. Someone had murdered someone, and that someone had gone to jail, and it was a, a great big tragedy and, 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 and drama. But the person, I believe it was their spouse, the, the person who had been murdered, their spouse was a believer, was a Christian, and felt that they needed to go and confront their spouse's murderer. So they went to prison, and they began to interact with the murderer, and they began to get to know the murderer. And they began to see that the murderer was extremely sad about what they'd done. And they developed a relationship. And this doesn't get romantic. Don't go that way. I know that's where your mind's going. It's not. Uh, but the, the Christian then came out and said, I have found myself at complete forgiveness of this individual. I completely forgive what they've done. And this, uh, this made national news and everything. So then there were all these advocate groups that said, let him out. Let him out. The person who has been most offended has forgiven them. The state has no reason any longer to continue. In the state of Oregon, it was a capital offense, but they don't have death penalty in Oregon. But they were going to be in prison forever. And people are saying, no, let them out. They've been forgiven. But the answer was, the damage that was done was not just to that individual family. Our entire society was harmed by this tragic event. And society has a role to speak to this. One individual's forgiveness is wonderful. That's great. But there's a larger issue at, at play here. Our society has been harmed by this. That's what makes a crime a crime. It's not just in, uh, between me and you. It affects us all. And in the same way, in the same kind of wooden analogy, our situation God can't. God may just say, yeah, I forgive you, but there's a greater issue. Everyone has been harmed by sin. It's not just me and you. And I have to do what is equal and fair and just and right for everyone involved. And so the biggest part of the story is, who then is really on trial? It is God. God is the one on trial. God's character, God's ability to righteously bring resolution to the rebellion that Satan brought in. It's not just about me and you. It's not just about us and this. It's about the larger issue of the universe. And when we begin to look at it from that broader context, many of the great teachings of the Bible from Sinai and from the temple and from you know the Gospels and everything else 
begins to come into focus when we understand the greater story. So I'm going to talk about this a few more times, how this makes sense and how this works over the next couple weeks. And I hope that you can join us here at the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church as we continue to look at the story of God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is always a journey. It is always a new experience to come to your scriptures and to learn a little bit more about what you are trying to convey to us. And even if we've read certain passages a hundred times before, it's amazing how you can bring freshness to it still. And even if we've been in the church many years or maybe we're new to the church, we can still see your place at unraveling the, the damage that has been done by sin and by Satan. So God, help us to not get lost in this. Help us to know our place. And Father, help us to not rely upon our own wisdom or strength to fill in the blanks. Let us always come to Scripture so that we can see what your plan and purpose is for all these challenges that we face today. And Lord, we love you. and We are so glad that you are the creator and you're also our redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you everyone so much. God bless. Uh, have a great week. If you're going to stay for potluck, we'll see you in a few moments. Other than that, hopefully we'll see you next Sabbath.